it's my birthday this week! So to celebrate, I thought I would compile a list of my top 10 unanswered questions. So these are a mix of questions I get asked all the time by people who are curious about space, probably like yourself watching this video, or that I think are the most interesting unanswered questions. And remember, the fact that we don't know the answer to these questions is a good thing because it means there's more to learn, more to know and more progress to be made. You might not agree with this list, so let me know in the comments below if you think there is another unanswered question that I have missed. This is my top 10 though. I mean, they're not actually ranked in order, even though they're numbered one to 10. I couldn't possibly rank them at all. I can't show favoritism to objects in space. Although anybody that actually knows me at all will know that if I was really hard pressed, the black hole questions would win out in the end. Which is why we're starting with number one, what's inside a black hole? No one knows. First up, if you're picturing a black hole as literally a hole in space that stuff falls into and is lost forever, stop. It's not a hole. A black hole is a place in space that has so much stuff in it that it's the heaviest thing in the universe. Black holes grow by eating or what we call accreting more matter. So really, I guess we should be calling them black mountains because they're essentially these huge piles of matter in the universe that we can't see because we'll never get any information from them because their gravity is so strong that light can't escape. The question is though obviously what happens to the matter that crosses the event horizon of a black hole that adds to that mountain's mass? Unsurprisingly we don't really no, the best clue we have is sort of from the Pikachu to a black hole's Raichu, right? The sort of pre-evolution side of things is a neutron star. A neutron star is the leftover core of a star that's crushed down so much that all you're left with is neutrons that are as tightly packed together as they possibly can be. The thing is though, if you keep adding more and more mass to that, you eventually the gravity is so strong that it overcomes the forces stopping the neutrons being squashed together. And then that's when you have a black hole. But of course, because we can't observe what that matter looks like, because we can't get light from it, we have no idea what form it takes once it gets squished. Maybe it is a whole new form of matter that we don't know about. Maybe it turns back into pure energy because E equals MC squared, as Einstein said. But then again, Maybe we'll just never know. Next up, what is the universe expanding into? We don't know. It's a bit of a misnomer, that question, because technically it's not a logical question to ask. So yes, the Big Bang created everything in the universe that we see around us, but it also created time and space itself. They didn't exist before the Big Bang. If space only exists in the universe, then asking what the universe is expanding into doesn't make sense because you're asking for a location and a location can only be found in space which doesn't exist outside the universe. Now having said that, there are a lot of hypotheses floating around the theoretical astrophysics community that there are multiverses, i.e. Our universe is not alone, there is not just one single universe, there are many universes and ours is just one of many. And so that as ours expands, the universes that we are somehow connected to around us, they contract because we're expanding into them, perhaps. That's purely theoretical though, and it probably always will be. But never say never, you know? Physicists might think of some clever way of saying if these exist, it would mean this in our own universe, and we can test for that. But this idea of an expanding universe leads us to our next question. What is dark energy? Or to put it another way, what is causing the expansion of the universe? What we do know though is that the universe is definitely expanding. When we look out into space, on average, all galaxies are moving away from us. And that really was the smoking gun evidence for the theory of the Big Bang. But it doesn't explain why that expansion is happening. There must be some force or energy that's pushing 
the universe out that's causing space to expand. Now we call that energy dark energy, but just because it has a name doesn't necessarily mean we know what it is. We don't even know any of its properties either. All we know is that it's exerting this negative pressure, i.e. a pressure pushing outwards, counteracting gravity. And it's currently winning that fight. Speaking of dark things, next up is what is dark matter made of? We don't know. <laughs> now, unlike dark energy, we actually know a lot more about dark matter and its properties. I made a video a couple of months ago on the history of how scientists begrudgingly came to the conclusion after, you know, decades worth of research that 85% of all the matter in the universe was actually this dark matter. Dark matter is essentially matter that doesn't interact with light, so it doesn't absorb light, it doesn't emit light, or it doesn't reflect light either. So that means we can't see it. But just because we can't see it doesn't mean we don't know it's there. Have you ever seen a million dollars? No. Just because you haven't seen it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Think about the wind, right? You can't see the wind but you see the trees move and so you know it's there. So we have a lot of similar evidence, but in space of dark matter existing because it interacts via gravity and that's how we know that it's there. And from those observations, we've been able to determine a couple of its properties. The thing is, those properties don't line up with any of the types of particles that particle physicists know about. So it's obviously some type of matter that we have never thought up before. If we could detect some here on Earth, then we might have half a chance. But until then, we're gonna be as ignorant as humanity was, say, two, three hundred years ago, when we didn't know about atoms. We knew that we existed, but we didn't know what we were made of. Sticking on the matter theme, the next question is, where is all the antimatter? No one knows. I did a recent video on this, but I still wanted to include it in here because I think it's such an important question. Now, unlike dark matter, which is incredibly abundant in the universe, you know, 85% of all the matter in the universe, antimatter is incredibly rare. And that's the big question. Why is it so rare? So antimatter is essentially the opposite of normal matter. So if you took an electron, which if you remember high school physics is the particle that goes round the centers of atoms. An electron has a negative charge. If you had an anti-electron, which is called a positron, it would have a positive charge. It would be its anti-particle. And if the two of those things met, they would cancel each other out and they would turn back into pure energy. E equals mc squared, energy and mass are the same thing, according to Einstein. And we call that process annihilation. Now, all of our scientific theories predict that in the Big Bang, there should have been equal amounts of matter and equal amounts of antimatter made. There was no preference to make one or the other. If that's the case though, then everything should have just annihilated and turned back into pure energy again. But obviously that didn't happen because we're now surrounded by a universe made of matter. Antimatter is still made in natural processes like radioactive decay. In fact, bananas are a massive source of these anti-electrons. The thing is, they just don't hang around for very long before they end up meeting a normal electron and turning back into pure energy again. So people are still trying to figure out in these huge big particle physics experiments like there is at CERN, why more matter than antimatter was created in the Big Bang. Sticking on the Big Bang theme, the next question is what happened in the first naught point one seconds of the universe? Or to put it another way, one times ten to the minus forty-three seconds. Because I don't want to say forty-two zeros all over again. I don't know! Not only do we not know, we don't even have the maths to know this one. Because at that point, the temperature and pressures in the universe are 
so high that the four sort of fundamental forces of physics, so gravity, electromagnetism, the strong and the weak force that look after sort of binding atoms together and radioactivity, they all merge to just become one like mega force and then nothing behaves like it should do anymore. In fact, if you use Einstein's theory of general relativity, which is one of our best theories, you know, it describes nearly everything we see in the universe in terms of gravity anyway, and you try and use that theory to predict what's happening at that time, you end up with what's called a singularity. So people might have heard of that term in reference to black holes, where you have an infinite amount of matter in an infinitely small space. Same is true here, but it could be an infinite pressure, an infinite temperature, an infinite amount of matter in an infinitely small space. What ends up happening is you have to divide by zero. And we know that mathematicians do not like dividing by zero. But even general relativity is probably thought to break down at that time, especially if the four forces merge into that one big mega force, because then it wouldn't describe everything properly. But also because there's probably loads of quantum effects that dominate on really tiny scales, which it probably can't describe properly. Now, you're probably okay with not knowing what happened in the first 1 times 10 to the minus 43 seconds of the universe. You're probably not losing any sleep over it. But you can bet that theoretical astrophysicists, well, they definitely are. Moving on from the Big Bang by a couple of hundred million years or so, up next is what came first, the galaxy or the black hole? We don't know. So after the universe has been around for a couple of hundred million years or so, and you know, everything's had time to just chill out, particles have had chance to form, atoms have had chance to form, everything started clumping together under gravity, you know, dark matter and normal matter, and stars might begin to form. The question is, what came first though then? Did a collection of stars form, i.e. a galaxy? Did one of them go supernova, it become a black hole, and then start to take in more matter and grow and grow until it became the heaviest thing in that collection of stars? So it sunk to the centre and over time grew into the supermassive black hole that we know exists at the centre of every galaxy. I actually did a video on how we know that about a year ago. It's actually one of my favourite videos I've ever made, so go check that out if you're interested. Or the other option is instead of gas clouds in the early universe collapsing to form stars first, what if those gas clouds directly collapsed into a, quite a large black hole in the first place, and then stars started to form around it in a galaxy, so the black hole was always in the centre from the very beginning? It's kind of like the astrophysics equivalent of the chicken or the egg, I guess. And there's actually been hints that a direct collapse into a black hole of, say, 10,000 times the mass of the sun in the very early universe could actually be happening, as in we actually have observational evidence of that happening from the Hubble Space Telescope, which has got a lot of people really excited. And whilst that single observation is very promising, you can bet we're going to need more than one thing to turn that hypothesis into fully accepted scientific theory. And now for something completely different. What causes fast radio bursts? If you haven't heard of fast radio bursts yet, well, get ready because your mind's about to be blown. They are incredibly short, like millisecond bursts of radio waves coming from space. We've been able to pinpoint their locations, they're coming from all across the sky, from all different areas, and we know just shy of a hundred or so of these fast radio bursts, and we still don't have an explanation for them. They're kind of this generation's pulsars, right? Pulsars were these very regular bursts of radio waves that were coming from space that we eventually figured out were neutron stars that were rotating, and they had this sort of beam of radio waves coming out of the poles, and they were acting a little bit like lighthouses. When they first discovered pulsars, they nicknamed them LGM, or Little Green Men, because they thought they were aliens. And obviously, once again, fast radio bursts, everyone's like, the Little Green Men are back. But I hate to disappoint, guys, but it's never aliens. <laughs> But unlike pulsars, these things are not regular. Some of them we've just got one burst from them and never heard from them again. Some of them we have seen them repeat, except they repeated with no pattern whatsoever. So the number of hypotheses just floating around, it's just, there's hundreds of them. Everything from supernova to gamma ray bursts to black holes to neutron stars to magnetars to blitzars. There's so many weird exotic things that people are coming up with to try and get an explanation for what we're seeing. 
it's likely that it probably is something to do with these magnetars or blitzars, something where you've got a very high magnetic field that's maybe producing these radio waves. But the long running joke in astrophysics is that we don't understand magnetic fields, which is probably why this question is still unanswered. Which brings me nicely to my next question. Why does the sun's magnetic field flip every 11 years? We don't know. So the sun actually goes through an 11 year cycle where it'll have a period of peak activity, where it'll have loads of sunspots and it'll burp off a load of high energy particles that gives us really spectacular aurora on here on earth. And then it'll go through a period of a lot quieter activity on this 11 year cycle. And combined with that, the magnetic field every 11 years sort of dies off and shrinks down and then goes down to sort of nothing. And then it bounces back again, but with the North Pole switched to the South Pole and the South Pole switched to the North Pole. And this is nothing to worry about. It last happened in 2013. I'm sure you'd never even noticed it happening. It also happens here on Earth though as well, but nowhere near as regularly. It's only happened on Earth something like 80 times in the past 183 million years that we know of at least. And we think we know what's causing that as well because the Earth has a, a liquid iron core and moving liquid metal sets up a magnetic field. And so if you disturb that movement somehow, either with an impact or because of like tectonic plates and volcanoes and earthquakes and whatever, then you might disrupt that movement and therefore start this sort of shift of the magnetic field. But on the sun, you've got this regular periodic flipping every 11 years that we just can't explain probably because we don't have a very good model of what's going on inside the sun. It's one of the reasons that people are still studying the sun in so much detail, because even though it's our star in our local neighborhood of space, we know very little about it relatively anyway. We know a lot more about it than we do other stars. But it's one of the reasons why, say, ESA's Solar Orbiter has just been launched and NASA's Parker Solar Probe as well. They're some of the missions that are trying to find out more and more about the sun so that we can answer this question and many more just like it. And finally, the question that humans have been asking for millennia does life exist on other planets? Are we truly alone in our universe? Honestly, personally, I don't think we'll ever know. Having said that, statistically, I do think it is likely that life exists out there somewhere. You know, we are one planet around one star of hundreds of billions of stars in our galaxy, the Milky Way. There are then uncountable number of galaxies out there, trillions, quadrillions of galaxies, all containing hundreds of billions of stars. I think it would be incredibly, incredibly arrogant of us to assume that we are the only one planet that managed to have the right conditions for life. The problem is how we'd ever confirm that life existed on a planet elsewhere. Like, think about it. Imagine if we found a planet that was almost identical to Earth, you know, the same mass, same size, same length of year, and it was orbiting a star that was almost identical to the sun. And we found the same signatures in its atmosphere as we have in our own atmosphere. What then? Would that be enough to conclude that life existed on that planet? I don't think it would be. I think you definitely have found the candidate for the most Earth-like planet elsewhere in our galaxy, but I don't think you could say for definite whether life existed on it or not. And you might just say, okay, Becky, well, then let's just go to that planet and find out. But what if that planet is, say, tens, hundreds, or even thousands of light years away? What then? But you might think, that's fine. We'll just kick back and, and wait for them to come to us, hopefully peacefully but they're gonna be limited by the same laws of physics we are. They still can't go fast in the speed of light just like us. So if they're coming from the other side of the galaxy, then, you know, we better hope they left when the dinosaurs were still alive. So despite being the biggest question of them all and one that, yeah, I would love to definitively answer. It's one I think we just all will have to accept that we might never know the answer to that. 
Hello, editing Becky here. Just before we get to the bloopers, I want to take a minute to thank this week's sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant is a problem solving website that gets you to learn by doing, not just by watching YouTube videos. So one of the things I always get asked or told is that someone wants to be an astrophysicist, but maybe they feel like they're no good at maths or they're no good at physics. Well, if you'd said to me that your dream in life is to become the first chair violin in an orchestra, but you're no good at violin, then I'd tell you to pick up a violin and practice, practice, practice. And so Brilliant allows you to do just that, but for your maths and your physics. If you want to take your knowledge of physics or maths, maybe like special relativity or gravity, or you want to learn more about how stars evolve, then Brilliant is for you. It teaches you to think like a scientist, breaking down problems into easy to understand chunks with interactive problems that give them this fun application so you know how to apply the knowledge that you're actually learning. So if you like the sound of that, then go to brilliant.org forward slash Dr. Becky. That's D-R-B-E-C-K-Y and sign up for free. Plus the first 200 people that go to that address will also get 20% off an annual premium subscription too. It is sponsorships like this from Brilliant that allow me to keep chatting science with all of you guys and for you lot to take your interest in science further. So head over there and give them a big thank you from me. Change in the battery. It's on sale till December. Oh, that's like a parody of a parody song. It's a weird one, Becky. Anywho, where was I? Oh yeah, Dark Matter. Oh, where to put my phone? 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 Oh, found it. So one of the things I always get asked, emails, DMs, whatever it might be. Ow, my arm. Jesus, Becky. 